Hey everyone, a blessed Pentecost week to all of you. Thanks a lot for tuning in. My reflection today is called Praying for Those in Hell. And let me unpack that a little bit for your edification. So, in the tradition of the Orthodox Church, as we prepare for celebrating Holy Pentecost, the Saturday before Holy Pentecost, and remember, Pentecost literally means in Greek, Pentecosti is 50, means 50 days after Pascha, and we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Holy Pentecost upon the church. The day before is what we call a Soul Saturday. It is a day dedicated to praying for the departed. Everyone turns in the lists of their loved ones who have departed this life. Um, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, godparents, one's former bishop or priests, pastors that you've had who have gone on to uh, the next life, godchildren, etc. We keep the memory of our departed alive uh, by our prayers. This is how love expresses itself uh, when one that you love departs this life, is you begin to pray for them and you hold them close in your heart and you remember them for the rest of your days until, by the grace of God, you can see them again in his kingdom. This is what we do. Soul Saturday, the Saturday before Holy Pentecost, uh, we pray for all of those who are departed this life uh, in all sorts of circumstances. And we have a long list of uh, circumstances in which we mention their departures. The next day is Holy Pentecost. And on the evening of Holy Pentecost, that would be Sunday night, we have what's called the Kneeling Vespers service. And we read these magnificent kneeling prayers. It's called this because it's the first time that we pray on our knees or prostrate since Pascha. During the days of Holy Pascha, we don't make prostrations on the ground and we don't do our prayers on our knees. We're celebrating the ennoblement of the human race uh, and the conquering of death in the three-day resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the vanquisher of the kingdom of Hades. On Pentecost night, Sunday night, Sometimes it's done right after the Sunday liturgy uh, so that people who live far away can be there. We pray three magnificent prayers. And the third prayer is particularly focused on praying for those in hell. And that's why uh, I entitled this reflection this way. And I want to talk to you about that. What does it mean to pray for those who are in Hades? And why, why do we do that? And <clears throat> what could possibly be happening in response to our prayers? Notice first that uh, the church traditionally does not assume that upon death, the person is immediately in the presence of Christ and glorified. Uh, that is a traditional Protestant concept, uh, but that is not the traditional Christian concept. The traditional Christian concept prior to the 16th century uh, is that uh, there is a journey. We develop this concept from the story of Lazarus and the rich man, for instance. Uh, angels come and they escort on a journey. We, in fact, have quite a few saints who have gone through this journey and have been allowed to come back to life and have described it for us. And it's not, close your eyes, bing, you're now in the presence of Jesus. Um, even the Virgin uh, had a journey. Uh, her journey was accompanied by Christ. Her son did come to his most pure mother uh, and receive her soul and uh, bring her into his presence and her body too, for that matter. Uh, but for us, we, we believe it's a journey, and that's why we have particular prayers that we make uh, over the 40 days. We pray intensely for our departed loved ones uh, in the first 40 days of their departure, and then we remember them consistently. So note that first, that uh, departing this life is a journey. It's an unmooring of a boat, and the, the boat moves uh, with angelic accompaniment, we trust, for believers to the presence of God into the kingdom of heaven. Also notice that uh, we all we don't assume that all go there. That assumption is what traditional Christians make for saints. That's what a saint is. A saint is a holy one who the church, the consciousness of the church recognizes, is in the presence of God, and is in paradise, and has been well pleasing to God. If we assume and we act as though every person, the second that they die, is immediately with Jesus, we are in fact functioning as self-canonists. We are canonizing saints and declaring that everybody is a saint. 
which is a very presumptuous thing to do. In fact, some people, uh, even some Christians, don't die and go to heaven. They don't go to paradise. Some uh, are confessing Christ improperly. Some call him Lord with their lips, but not with their lives, and will not inherit the kingdom of God. Just remember the mystery, uh, the shock of those goats when our separ Savior separated the sheep from the goats, and he said to the goats, depart from me, you cursed once into the everlasting fire. They were shocked that they were being sent there. They thought that they were on their way to the kingdom of heaven, and they said, when did we ever not do that to you, Lord? And when did we do that? They, they were completely oblivious to their condition. That should concern us, of course, greatly concern us. So we pray, we pray, and we pray for our loved ones and those that may be in Hades. Now, let me address that a little bit. Uh, on Pentecost evening, in the kneeling prayers, it's a normal vespers, and after the entrance, the priest turns towards the people and he kneels down, leads them in bending their knees. They all kneel and he reads three extensive prayers. I'm not going to speak about prayer one and two, although they are magnificent. I want to read rather a portion of the third prayer because it's there that we make our most bold prayer for those who are in hell. Now, I'm using the word hell not in its formal final sense. In that sense, hell does not exist yet and neither does heaven in the sense of the eternal kingdom of God after the resurrection of the dead when our souls and bodies are reunited and we're glorified and fit to be with the Lord God forever and ever in the final state. Uh, right now is the intermediate state and those who, are, who love Christ and are attached to him by faith and live that way, um, go after death to be with him, which St. Paul says is very much better than this life. It was St. Paul's ambition to depart and be with Christ, which is very much better, he says. And those that uh, are not attached to Christ and have not lived for him go into Hades. It can also be called hell, as long as you know that the final state of hell, which is a state in which people are sent definitively at the end who are rebels and uh, godless. But they do so, they get sent there in their bodies and their souls, not just uh, in their souls. So we pray in this marvelous third prayer for those who are in Hades. We don't know who is where, except for the saints. Uh, the consciousness of the church bears witness to the saints, but it would be presumptuous of us to act like we have penetrating insight into the next life and we can see who's in Hades and who's in paradise. We don't know that, even of our closest loved ones. We don't know the inner heart of every person, even of our closest loved ones. We don't know men's secrets. God knows secrets. And that's why God and God alone is the judge of the living and the dead. He's the one who places souls in paradise or in Hades. So we should have some reserve, some serious reserve, honoring the mystery of what uh, is taking place. We do believe that those who find themselves in Hades are unable to repent and do good deeds. One of the reasons that we pray for those who are in Hades, especially our fellow believers who end up in Hades, we pray for them so that because they can't pray for themselves and they can't repent for themselves. And so we lift our prayers to them, beginning in the funeral service and continuing uh, throughout our lives, hoping also that our loved ones will pray for us upon our departure. We appeal to God for his mercy upon those, because though they can't help themselves, we do believe it is the conviction of the church that our prayers can greatly assist those who are in Hades. Hades has been plundered once definitively by the Lord Christ. He was crucified. And then he descended through the cross into hell and broke down its gates and decimated the power of Satan and the power of death by atoning for human sin and conquering Satan and opening the doors of paradise. But those who have died poorly and not in strong piety in this life uh, have refilled Hades uh, since its plundering. And we ask Christ to continue to add to his plundering by our prayer to, to in his great mercy, to make those who uh, haven't prepared well for death his trophies of grace. This is what we're asking for uh, in our prayers. It's how we love those. As we try to, by our petitions, have Christ continue to bring people from Hades 
uh, to the next life. So listen to what we say exactly, because here you'll see the mind of the church in this third kneeling prayer done on the night of Pentecost. O ever-flowing fountain of life and light, creative power and co-eternal with the Father, who has most excellently fulfilled the whole dispensation of the salvation of mortals, Christ our God, who did burst the indestructible bonds of death and the bolts of Hades and has trampled down the multitude of evil spirits. What a magnificent description of what Christ has done to hell, how he decimated it. Who did offer thyself as a blameless victim, giving thine immaculate body as a sacrifice, unblemished and inviolate of all sin, and through that dread and indescribable act of sacrifice, bestowing eternal life upon us. So here the church is affirming not only did Christ plunder and destroy hell, but he atoned for sin on the cross, and through the cross we have eternal life. Who did descend into Hades and break down its eternal bars, showing forth the way up to those who sat in the lower world, who with allurements of divine wisdom did entice the author of evil, the dragon of the abyss, and with cords of gloom didst bind him in Hades in unquenchable fire. So Jesus frees the captives of Hades and brings them with him and instead binds Satan. Remember his promise about binding. It's mentioned in the 20th chapter of the Revelation and also in uh, St. Matthew's Gospel, I think chapter 12, where Christ speaks about how he binds this... He enters the strong man's house by binding it so he can plunder, plunder his property, bring back those who are truly his, the property that had been stolen by Satan. Who didst descend into Hades and break down its eternal bars, showing forth the way up to those who sat in the lower world, who with allurements of divine wisdom did entice the author of evil, the dragon of the abyss, and with cords of gloom did bind him in Hades in unquenchable fire, and didst confine him in outer darkness by thine infinite might. Thou who art the greatly glorified wisdom of the Father, didst manifest thyself as a great helper to the oppressed, and did enlighten those that sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Those who were down there were enlightened by Christ and greatly helped. Thou, Lord of eternal glory and beloved Son of the Father most high, light everlasting of light everlasting, Son of righteousness, hearken to us who pray to thee. Now we're going to ask him things. And give rest to the souls of thy servants, our fathers and brethren, who have fallen asleep before us, and our other kinsmen after the flesh, and all thine own who are in the faith, of whom we now make memorial. For in thee is the power over all, and in thy hand thou holdest all the ends of the earth. Almighty Master, God of the fathers and Lord of mercies, maker of the race of mortals and immortals, and of every nature of man, of that which is brought together and again put asunder, of life and of the end of life, of sojourning here and of translation there, who dost measure the years of life and set the times of death. Notice God is, just, is the key to, and the one who fashioned soul and body together, who holds life together, who created the beginning and end of life, who has been with us in our sojourning here and even in our translation to the next life, who measures the limits of our lives. He's intimately involved, this prayer saying, in every aspect of our lives. He brings down into Hades and raiseth up, binding in infirmity and releasing unto power, dispensing present things according to need and ordering those to come as is expedient, quickening with the hope of resurrection those that are smitten with the sting of death. Thyself, O Master of all, God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of those who are far off upon the sea, who on this last and great saving day of Pentecost did show forth to us the mystery of the Holy Trinity, consubstantial and co-eternal, undivided and unmingled, and did pour out the descent and presence of thy holy and life-giving spirit in the form of tongues of fire upon thy holy apostles, appointing them to be the evangelists of our pious faith and showing them to be confessors and preachers of the true theology who also on this all-perfect and saving feast dost deign, here it is, on this all-perfect and saving feast, dost deign to receive oblations and supplications for those bound in Hades, and grantest unto us the great hope that respite and comfort will be sent down from thee to the departed from the grief that doth bind them. So here, the church is telling us that God accepts our prayers, our supplications, and our oblations when we make offerings of, of prospera and offerings of, of candles and offerings of charity in the name of the departed. God accepts our supplications for them and our oblations for those who are bound in Hades presently. And he grants us great hope that respite and comfort will be sent down to them from, from the grief that binds them.
There it is. Prayers for the departed, even those in Hades, are powerful. Hearken to us, thy humble and piteous ones who pray, and give rest to the souls of thy servants who have fallen asleep before us in a place of brightness, a place of verdure, a place of repose. This is where we want God to take them. Take them and put them in that bright place, a place of beauty and repose, where sickness, sorrow, and sighing have fled away. And do thou place their souls in the tabernacles of the righteous. Make, move them from darkness to light by these prayers, O Lord, by your mercy. For the dead praise thee not, O Lord. So here we're petitioning God and saying, Lord, do that because they're going to join in the chorus of praise for your great mercy to them. For the dead praise thee not, O Lord, neither do those in Hades dare to offer thee confession. But we, the living, bless thee and supplicate thee and offer propitiatory prayers and sacrifices for their souls. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? We offer propitiation. We're participating with God uh, in their salvation by our propitiatory prayers and even the sacrifices that we make for their souls. The prayer continues. I'll read just one more portion here. Receive, therefore, O Master, our prayers and supplications, and give rest to all the fathers and mothers and children and brothers and sisters of each of us, and to any other of our kindred and of our people, and to every soul that hath gone to rest before, in the hope of the resurrection unto life everlasting. Set their spirits and their names in the book of life, in the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the land of the living, in the kingdom of heaven, in a paradise of bliss, leading all by thy radiant angels into thy holy abode, raising up also with thee our bodies in the day, which hath been appointed according to thy holy and unfailing promise. What an um, incredible prayer. This is why, dear ones, you all should attend the kneeling prayers of Vespers and pray most conscientiously and sincerely for your departed loved ones. And this is the inspiration to continue to show great love for those that have gone on before. Keep your dear departed ones in your hearts. Those that you know have died well, those that you know have died mediocre, <laughs> those that you think have died poorly, whoever they be, bring their names humbly before God and ask for his mercy upon them so that you too might be contributing to the great hope of their salvation by the mercy of God. God be with you, dear ones. Now available at patristicnectar.org. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to present a five-part lecture series by Father Josiah Trenum, entitled The Nicene Creed, An Introduction. The Nicene Creed is the singular and universal statement of faith of the one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church. It possesses complete authority in the Orthodox Church and is recited in every divine liturgy and daily in the prayers of the faithful. In these lectures, the Christian faith is summarized and the content of the Creed itself is examined so that the faith once delivered to the saints can be known embraced and lived. For these and other available titles, please visit our website at patristicnectar.org.